To be honest with you, I don't, I don't really know because uh, my, I actually fell in love with acting in school and I was offered a, a scholarship to the uh, Shakespeare. Uh, For many years, when mentioning the name Julian Lennon, people often think of fame, success, wealth and musical talent that not everyone can achieve. However, few people know that behind that flashy appearance, Julian also had to face a little-known dark side. From family, personal life, or career difficulties, let's explore. When Julian Lennon stepped onto the stage, he was a force to be reckoned with, bursting with energy and charisma. However, his childhood was far from the happy image many might imagine. What was his upbringing like? Julian's childhood could be described as quite traumatic, largely due to his strained relationship with his absent father. But what happened in his life? If you're curious, join us as we explore Julian Lennon's story of tragedy, loss, and love. His father, John Lennon, was a legendary musician who made a huge contribution to music and popular culture. Along with Paul McCartney, John Lennon formed one of the greatest and most iconic songwriting duos in music history. As a prominent member of the Beatles, Lennon was not only a talented singer, but also an inspiration to millions of fans around the world. He was a musical icon, beloved not only by those who followed his career, but also by his bandmates. However, when it comes to his role as a father, the praise is sadly lacking. John Lennon, despite being a great artist, did not exhibit the best qualities of a father. That's right, the legendary singer we admire was not the ideal father. Although it may sound harsh, this is what his son has publicly admitted about their relationship. So how did the story between John Lennon and his son unfold? Let's explore this story and learn about the conflicts in their relationship. John Winston Lennon, born on 9th October 1940 in Liverpool, was the only son of Julia and Alfred Lennon. Alfred was an Irish-born sailor who was often absent from the family's life. Despite this, he sent his wife and children paychecks, helping them to sustain their lives in Newcastle Road, Liverpool, where Lennon lived with his mother. However, the check stopped coming when Alfred went on an unexcused absence in February 1944, marking a long separation between father and son. When Alfred Lennon finally returned home after a six-month absence, he offered to look after the family, but Julia, who was pregnant with her new partner's child, declined the offer. For much of his childhood and adolescence, John Lennon lived with his mother's sister, Mimi, at the Mendips house on Menlove Avenue, Woolton. Mimi and her husband, George Toogood Smith, had no children of their own, and she was given custody of Lennon. John's mother, Julia, visited him regularly, and Lennon also visited her occasionally at Blomfield Road in Liverpool. These were important meetings, as Julia shared Elvis Presley records with him, taught him to play the banjo, and showed him how to play Fats Domino's Ain't That a Shame. Lennon later reflected on those years, especially his relationship with his family and his rebellious nature. In September 1980, he admitted, Part of me wants to be accepted, not to be this crazy, loud poet-songwriter, but I can't pretend to be someone I'm not. Lennon also shared that from a young age, he was warned by his parents that he was a troublemaker because of his non-conformist nature. He once said that he had destroyed the families of his friends, partly because he was jealous of what they had, while he lacked a complete family. He called the women in his family five strong, intelligent, beautiful women, and his mother was among them despite her failure to cope with life's hardships. Lennon praised these women for giving him a strong feminist upbringing, which he considered 
an important lesson from his family. The feeling of being deprived of family affection had a profound effect on Lennon's personality, and he admitted that from a young age he had no concept of a typical family. Instead, he built his own family, a family of strong women who nurtured and educated him. Lennon grew up in an Anglican family and attended Dovedale Primary School. After passing his 11-plus exams, he went on to Quarry Bank High School in Liverpool in September 1952. There, Lennon was described as a cheerful, humorous, easygoing, and energetic boy. But he was also involved in fights, bullying his classmates, and disturbing the classroom. Despite this, Lennon quickly distinguished himself as the class clown, even drawing humorous cartoons for the school's homemade magazine, The Daily Howl. In 1956, his mother Julia bought John his first guitar. It was a cheap Galatone Champion acoustic, and Julia lent him five pounds and ten shillings to buy it. However, she requested that the guitar be delivered to her home instead of her sister Mimi's, as Mimi did not support John's passion for music. Mimi did not believe that John could become famous through music. She often told him that although the guitar was great, he would not be able to make a living from it. During his final years at school, Lennon's behavior changed dramatically. Teachers commented that he had misguided ambitions and that his energy was often misdirected. They felt that his work lacked seriousness and effort and that he often drifted away from his studies instead of making the most of his abilities. This attitude eventually caused tension in Lennon's relationship with Mimi. Not only did he fail his O-level exams, but it took the intervention of Mimi and the school principal to gain admission to Liverpool College of Art. There, Lennon began to display a teddy boy fashion sense, and his rebellious behavior almost got him expelled. According to Cynthia Powell, Lennon's classmate and future wife, he was expelled from school before completing his senior year. But who would have thought that his dreams were indeed only a matter of time? John soon took his fate into his own hands and developed an iconic group, the start of a legacy. At the age of 15, John Lennon formed a skiffle group called the Quarrymen. Inspired by the name of Quarry Bank High School, the group was formed in September 1956 and by the summer of 1957, they were performing a mix of songs, half skiffle and half rock and roll. These were the early years of Lennon's musical career when he discovered and expressed his passion for music. Lennon first met Paul McCartney at a gig by the Quarrymen, and Lennon later invited McCartney to join the band. McCartney revealed that John's aunt, Mimi, was very concerned about Lennon's friends, especially those from lower-class backgrounds, and she often tried to intervene whenever Lennon invited friends to his house. However, McCartney's father was also not supportive of the relationship, believing that Lennon would get his son into trouble. However, McCartney's father nevertheless allowed the band to rehearse in the family living room which allowed Lennon to write his first song, Hello Little Girl, which became a huge hit in the UK in 1963. McCartney, with his musical knowledge, introduced his friend George Harrison to the band as lead guitarist. However, Lennon initially thought Harrison, then only 14, was too young to join. McCartney, however, arranged a special audition on the upper deck of a Liverpool bus where Harrison performed Raunchy for Lennon and was immediately invited to join the Quarrymen. In addition, another friend of Lennon's from art school, Stuart Sutcliffe, joined the group as bassist. The group eventually morphed into the Beatles, but they still lacked a drummer. So they invited Pete Best to join the group, and together they embarked on a 48-night tour in Hamburg, West Germany, in August 1960. This was a pivotal moment in their career. In 1962, Brian Epstein, who had spotted the Beatles' potential,
became the group's manager, helping shape their career and making them one of the greatest bands of all time. Brian Epstein, despite having no previous experience in artist management, had a profound influence on the Beatles' image and style. He was the first to help the group establish a uniform dress code and stage manner, which contributed greatly to the group's professional image. After Stuart Sutcliffe decided to stay in Hamburg, Paul McCartney moved to bass, and Pete Best was replaced by Ringo Starr as drummer. This was the official four-piece lineup of the Beatles, and the lineup that would accompany the group until their breakup in 1970. The Beatles' debut single, Love Me Do, was released in October 1962 and reached number 17 on the UK charts. The group then recorded their first album, Please Please Me, on 11th of February 1963. Notably, they completed the entire album in just under 10 hours, one of the days when Lennon suffered from a severe cold which was audible in his voice, especially on Twist and Shout, the last song recorded that day. On this album, Lennon and McCartney collaborated on eight of the 14 songs. Although their songs were notable for their creativity and memorability, Lennon once shared that, with a few exceptions, he never attempted to include wordplay or deep messages in the lyrics. According to Lennon, they simply wrote pop songs without any intention of being too complicated, mainly to create a pleasant sound, while the content of the lyrics was usually not too important. In a 1987 interview, McCartney recalled that the other members of the group admired Lennon, referring to him as their Little Elvis. McCartney shared that Lennon was not only the older of the two, but also the leader of the group the most intelligent and quick-witted, the one whom all the members respected. By early 1963, the Beatles had achieved great success in the UK, and during this tour, Lennon also had another great joy. In April 1963, his first son Julian was born. Lennon met his son just three days later, marking a major milestone in his life outside of his musical career. Lennon made fun of the crowd as they were performing at the Royal Variety Show, which was attended by the Queen Mother and other members of the British royal family. I'd like to request your assistance with our next song. If you are in one of the more affordable seats, please clap your hands. For the rest of you, if you would simply rattle your jewellery, you may do the same. After a year of incredible success, which earned them the label of Beatlemania, in the United Kingdom, the band made their historic debut in the United States on The Ed Sullivan Show in February 1964. This performance marked the beginning of their rise to prominence on the international stage. After that, there were two years during which Lennon was constantly traveling, shooting films, and composing songs. During this time, he also authored two books under his name and was working on getting a book written on Spain. When the Beatles were honoured with the title of Members of the Order of the British Empire, MBE, in the Queen's Birthday Honours in 1965, they were given recognition from the British establishment. During March of that year, he and Harrison were unwittingly exposed to LSD by a dentist who was giving a dinner party for the two artists and their spouses. The dentist added substance to the coffee that was distributed to the participants at the party. When they were ready to go, their host disclosed what they had consumed and strongly cautioned them not to leave the home because of the effects that were expected to follow. The warning was well worded, since later, when they were in a lift at a nightclub, they all believed that the house was on fire. During an interview that took place in March 1996 with Maureen Cleave, a reporter for the Evening Standard, John Lennon made the statement that Christianity would be eradicated. It will disappear and become smaller. At this point, we are more well-known than Jesus. What will come first, rock and roll 
or Christianity. I have no idea which one will dominate. It was five months later that a magazine in the United States quoted the statement, and it created a significant deal of offense in the United States, even though it was mostly ignored in England. Following the ramifications of those comments, which included the destruction of albums by the Beatles, activities by the Ku Klux Klan, and threats against John Lennon, the band ultimately decided to disband and stop touring as a result of these events. The group eventually disbanded, even though they continued to interact with one another. The question is, however, what became of these wonderful connections following the separation? long after the band had disbanded. During the years that followed the Beatles' final dissolution in 1970, John Lennon maintained a cordial relationship with Ringo Starr. However, his relationships with Paul McCartney and George Harrison were more complicated. In the beginning, he was close to Harrison, but once John Lennon left for the United States in 1971, the two of them began to grow apart. When Harrison was in New York for his December Dark Horse tour in 1974, Lennon agreed to join him on stage. However, following a disagreement on Lennon's unwillingness to sign an agreement that would officially dissolve the Beatles' legal partnership, Lennon ultimately decided not to join Harrison on stage. When Harrison visited John Lennon during his five years away from the music industry, he subsequently stated, that he had the impression that Lennon was attempting to speak with him, but that his relationship with Ono stopped him from doing so. Additionally, Harrison caused Lennon to feel upset in 1980 when he published his autobiography titled I, Me, Mine. In an interview with Playboy, Lennon stated, I was hurt by it, by glaring omission. The impact that I have had on his life is completely non-existent. He can recall every guitarist and saxophonist that he encountered in the years that followed. I do not appear in the book. In terms of sentiments, Lennon was the most passionate about McCartney. Not only did John Lennon insult him with the words of his song, How Do You Sleep?, but he also clashed with him through the press for a full three years after the band had broken up. After some time had passed, the two individuals started to re-establish some aspects of the strong connection that they had previously had. In 1974, they even played music together once more before finally drifting apart once more. Lennon stated that they watched the episode of Saturday Night Live in which Lorne Michaels made a $3,000 offer to persuade the Beatles to rejoin the show during McCartney's final visit in April of 1976. McCartney's visit was the last time to see the Beatles. According to Lennon, the two individuals had even contemplated traveling to the studio to make a mock appearance and attempt to collect their portion of the money. However, they were just too exhausted to consider doing so. An interview that took place three days before McCartney's passing provided Lennon with a summary of his sentiments toward McCartney. Paul McCartney and Yoko Ono are the only two individuals with whom I have chosen to collaborate over the entirety of my career. You've made a good choice there. Lennon always felt a musical competition with McCartney, and he continually listened to his work. This was in addition to the fact that he had been estranged from McCartney. According to Fred Seaman, who was Lennon and Ono's secretary at the time, John Lennon was pleased to kick back and relax during his professional sabbatical from 1975 until just before his death. This was the case as long as Paul McCartney continued to produce stuff that Lennon considered to be of a low quality. It was in 1980 the year that Lennon returned to the studio that McCartney published Coming Up. This was the year that Lennon became aware of the situation. It was impossible for him to unhear the music in his thoughts. Through a humorous complaint, he expressed that it was driving him crazy. When asked in the same year if the gang was feared adversaries 
or the closest of friends, John Lennon said that they were neither and that he had not seen any of them in a very long time. He also stated that he had not seen any of them in so long. In addition to that, he stated, I still love those guys. Although the Beatles have disbanded, John, Paul, George, and Ringo continue to perform. There is one connection that John continues to muck up, and that is the truth about the relationship that he has with Julius Lennon. This is true even though John has distinct relationships with his former bandmates. Even if the couple isn't particularly open about their relationship, we have a few interviews in which Julian opens up about his struggles and discusses with the world the aspects of his upbringing that were less than joyful. In a conversation that took place when Julius was 48 years old, he disclosed that he was contemplating whether or not he should get married or have children. He elaborated on the source of his views, which he identified as his father. The explanation that he provided was that John Lennon was a young man who had no idea what he was doing when he decided to have children. This was a mistake that Julian did not want to let happen again. To prepare himself for taking on such a significant duty, he desired to first discover the essence of who he was. The very fact that they made this revelation reveals a great deal about the bond that they shared. Now, words of this audacity would drive anybody to wonder what precisely occurred to cause John's son to detest him in such a manner, and they would also encourage Julian not to try his hand at being a parent simply because he was afraid that he would be like his father. First, let's take a look at the dynamic inside their family so that we can have a better idea. Relating to the Lennon family, Cynthia Powell and John Lennon were both students at the Liverpool College of Art in 1957, when they first became acquainted with one another. Even though she was studying design, Cynthia also attended lessons in lettering, much like John Lennon once did. As a result of the fact that he never brought any sketching supplies with him, Lennon was continually borrowing pens and pencils from Powell. Powell eventually found out that the only reason he was there was because previous instructors had refused to educate him. An aura of respectability surrounded Powell, and she mingled in different social circles than the man who would eventually become her husband. Powell finally colored her hair blonde after learning that John Lennon was fascinated with the French actress Brigitte Bardot. Initially, Powell was concerned about Lennon's appearance and attitude, but she eventually turned her hair golden. It was in the fall of 1958 when the two first started dating. On the other hand, this partnership was not from the beginning all sunshine and rainbows. Jealousy was a natural trait for John Lennon, and his obsessiveness frequently manifested itself in violent conduct. Following his observation of Powell's dance with Stuart Sutcliffe, Powell remembered in her book named John, which was published in 2005, that he had one strike her. The two ended up parting for three months, following John's apology, after which they reconciled and went back together. Cynthia admitted in her biography that although he never again physically abused her, he could still be cruel and cruel to her verbally. She said that he was never physically violent to her again. After some time had passed, John Lennon remarked that he had never questioned his attitude toward women before meeting Yoko Ono. He stated that the song Getting Better by the Beatles told the tale of his or his classmates' struggles. Back in the day, I was a terrible person to my girlfriend and any woman in general. I used to be a hitter. I was unable to articulate my thoughts, so I hit. In my fights with guys, I also hit women. This is the reason why I can't stop talking about peace. Following John's discovery that Cynthia was carrying a child, the couple ultimately tied the knot on August 23, 1962. 
The fact that they were married, however, was concealed from the public by their manager, Brian Epstein, who was concerned that a married Beatle would turn off the audiences. The beginning of his marriage coincided with the beginning of Beatlemania in the United Kingdom. The evening of his wedding day was the first time he had performed, and from that point on, he would continue to do so virtually every day. Cynthia believed that the beginning of the dissolution of their marriage was caused by John Lennon's usage of LSD, which she said caused her to have the impression that John was no longer interested in her. During the year 1967, as the party was traveling by rail to Bangor, Wales, for the Transcendental Meditation Seminar that was being taught by Maharishi Yogi, a police officer did not recognize her and prevented her from entering the train. As time went by, she reflected on how the event appeared to be a metaphor for the dissolution of their marriage. 1963 was the year that Julian was brought into the world. John had just become 23 years old when he was born, and Cynthia had just turned 24. But by the late 1960s, John had married Yoko Ono, and Julian and Cynthia were left to fend for themselves. John would later marry and raise a family with Yoko Ono. Cynthia was enraged when Lennon bit into the apple in her artwork, Apple, and he later explained to her that the woman was only attempting to get funding for her avant-garde work. Like his mother, Cynthia's marriage to Lennon, Julian's birth was concealed from the public because Epstein believed that the Beatles' financial success would be jeopardized if word got out. Julian recalled that some 40 years later, when I was a little kid living in Weybridge, I would come home from school carrying a watercolor picture that I had created. A group of celebs and a blonde girl I knew from school were all that was involved. Plus, Dad said, What's this? Lucy floats. Through the sky with diamonds, I exclaimed. Despite claims that it was based on the letters LSD, Lennon maintained that it was not. He used it as the title of a Beatles song nevertheless. Julian felt more connected to McCartney than his father, and Lennon was aloof from him. Julian has never hidden the fact that his father's leaving devastated him when he was a little boy, naive and unprepared for the world. Julian has been very forthcoming about the intense feelings he experienced as a kid following his father's departure, including the fact that it looked as though his dad had vanished from existence. He went on to say that he and his mum felt ignored because of his father, John's public romance, with his second wife, Yoko Ono. However, he has also confirmed that they were still remembered and shared a tale of how Paul McCartney composed the song Hey Jules after contacting them. The title of the song was then altered to Hey Jude. According to Lennon, that song is his finest work. It all began with a song dedicated to my son Julian. Hey Jude became his new moniker. Yoko and I were always the ones I assumed it was about, but he disproved that. Following this, Julian came clean about the fact that he had very little communication with his father. After he was silent for many years, Cynthia tried to reconnect them as a father and son. The Irish Times reports that John admitted to having a planned second son, in contrast to his first son, John, who was born via careless drinking. The key distinction is that Sean is a planned child. As a youngster, my affection for Julian remained unwavering. He is my son even now. He said that he was born from a bottle of booze, or that he belonged to him because medications weren't available back then. Not only does this demonstrate how John felt about the 13-year age difference between his two kids, but it also reveals the side of him that was not particularly kind, even though he presented himself to the world as someone who stood for love and peace. In addition, 
Julian has expressed his dissatisfaction with his father's public preaching, stating that he has never experienced any of the love and serenity that his father has spoken about. In an interview that took place in 1998, he referred to his father as a hypocrite and added that John may have been someone who talked about love on earth for the world, but he did not have any love for people in his life. After seeing a few of the interviews in which Julian has discussed his background, we have learned that he considered John to be a poor father, and it is not unexpected to understand why he felt this way. Nevertheless, it is fascinating to observe that Julian did not harbor any animosity toward the second family that his father had. Julian has also mentioned that he got along well with Sean Lennon, who is the son of Yoko Ono, even though Sean may not be as keen on maintaining their relationship currently. Even if they don't always agree with each other, he still has a lot of respect for Yoko Ono, because Julian is excellent in a variety of areas, including photography, music, documentary filming, filmmaking, and charity. It is evident that he acquired some of his father's artistic qualities. However, the things that he was unable to obtain from his father were his love, his compassion, and his quality time. The cruel fact is that although Julian's father may have played the role of an enemy in his son's life, John himself also had a lot of challenges and fights of his own. We have spoken a lot about all the tragedies that have occurred in Julian's life, but the tragedy is that John too had a lot of his troubles and battles. Just like his kid, John's time spent in this world was not exactly filled with joy and contentment. Some of the turmoil and catastrophes that occurred in his personal life were the result of harsh fate, but some of them were also the result of his reckless acts. His personal life was full to the brim with all kinds of disorders and disasters. Therefore, let's take a more in-depth look at the problems that the famous musician John Lennon was experiencing, the personal misfortunes that John Lennon experienced. Due to his struggles with substance usage, John Lennon had a great deal of difficulty. Numerous individuals think that this not only had an impact on his ability as a vocalist, but also played a big part in the subsequent dissolution of the Beatles. In 1969, John was suffering from a severe addiction to a drug. At this time, there was a lack of understanding regarding opiate addiction, and George Harrison, Paul McCartney, and Ringo Starr could only watch in profound concern as John Lennon and Yoko Ono both openly ingested it. The three individuals were aware that it was something that was far more dangerous than they were willing to go. John, who had spent most of his good days working relentlessly to bring the band to new heights, was filled with a great deal of grief as a result of the band's dissolution, which occurred in what seemed like no time at all. This development did not come as a surprise to anybody. It is physically impossible to discuss the misfortunes that John endured throughout his life without also discussing how it came to an end. A musician named John, who was 40 years old at the time of his death, was brutally murdered by Mark David Chapman. Worse still, it wasn't the first time these two had crossed paths. A young, unusually shy admirer approached him on the street on the day of his murder at 5 p.m. After a brief photo op with John signing the CD, Ono and John departed from the Dakota for their recording session at the record factory. However, the fan opened fire with five shots at John as he held the autographed CD about six hours after the session finished at approximately 10.50 p.m. The next day, Ono released a statement disputing the idea of a funeral for John, concluding by stating that John loved and prayed for humanity. Then, you should help him out. After his cremation in Hartsdale, New York's Ferncliff Cemetery, Ono spread his ashes in Central Park, where the Strawberry Fields Memorial 
was subsequently built. Ignoring his lawyer's counsel, Chapman pled guilty to second-degree murder and received a life sentence without the possibility of a trial. John wished to repair his relationship with his son in the last interview he gave before he passed away, but he was tragically killed before his dream could be fulfilled. Later in life, Julian acknowledged that he hadn't forgiven his father, despite his earlier claims to the contrary. He made a statement about how he had conflicting sentiments regarding his father and how his forgiveness is just verbal. Additionally, Julian has brought up the fact that their father-son relationship was about to take a turn for the better before the father's tragic death. He said that John had been in a better position and had made it clear that he wanted to get back in touch with him and the family. In retrospect, Julian did acknowledge that he felt he understood his dad better because of his job. Julian also revealed some touching recollections of his father's time with him after John's death. His childhood home in Kenwood brought up warm memories of the late 1960s when he innocently saw what he considers to have been the passing of some of the most legendary musicians of all time. Julian told a writer named Joshua David Stein that his boyhood home was the setting for countless joyful memories. Furthermore, Julian acknowledged that when he was a little child, he thought his father was content with his family, their house, and his position in the world. He found it shocking when everything changed so abruptly. What do you think? Was Julius's relationship with his dad beyond saving? Please share your thoughts in the comments section below. We would love to hear from you. And don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel for more interesting updates. Thank you and see you in the next videos.